Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our web conference today. Our talk today on norovirus is aimed at providing you and your staff with new tools to deal with the scourge of those very nasty annual attacks from this also very contagious virus. So we're going to focus on two different approaches. Um, one, if you're planning to develop a new norovirus prevention and response program, I'm going to show you some specific strategies and key elements to get your program moving. If you think you just need to tweak or enhance your existing process, we'll talk about some new ideas to help you assess if your current program is sufficiently robust. I'll provide you with some references and links to access and download the various tools for this presentation. Now let's come on to the um, objectives. To meet our first objective, we're going to take a fresh look at the factors that increase the potential for an outbreak. As infection preventionists, we do know that application of a bundled approach has led to sustained decrease in some HAIs, such as the central line bundle, to decrease uh, central line uh, infections. So the second objective is to identify key components of a well-constructed package of interventions for norovirus prevention and a rapid response plan. There has been new evidence recently published to support neurovirus prevention interventions. And that takes us to our uh, third objective, which is to prepare you to translate those, that evidence um, into actionable facility practices. Okay, well, neurovirus has been um, recognized as the principal cause of worldwide epidemics of AGE, or acute gastroenteritis, in all age groups. And we'll use that AGE uh, acronym throughout the um, presentation. Outbreaks of this highly contagious virus continue to sweep across the nation every year and resulting in sensational headlines like you see on the screen. A norovirus illness can be introduced into your facility by a variety of sources. And once your healthcare facility is affected by norovirus, you can be swamped by what I like to call a, a tsunami of GI illness as it blitzes through your clinical areas and decimates your staffing patterns. From looking at the nursing home reports that we get and uh, listening to the results of the help desk calls that come in to the authority about norovirus outbreaks that have occurred uh, both this year and last year, I know that many of you on the call have had some experience with a norovirus outbreak. Um, unfortunately, I've also had the experience um, of several outbreaks. Uh, my first one was as a relatively new um, infection preventionist in a 244-bed long-term care facility with the subacute unit and the gerocyte unit. I had just gotten back from vacation, and the you-know-what hit the fan. So I got out my APIC outbreak book, and I got out my policy manual, and I was all prepared to, to go fight the good fight. And my big mistake was I tried to handle everything from surveillance to resources, communication, monitoring, all by myself. And, of course, that, I was doomed to fail, and um, the virus went through the entire building, and we were closed to admissions for a month. So the next outbreak that I had was in acute care. And I did have a plan, but it was mostly in my head. Um, with this CEO and the Philadelphia uh, Health Department, not the Department of Health, we had to close uh, two of our units in the hospital for two weeks. And I still did all the education and communication, et cetera, by myself. I had a team, and I thought we were prepared, but they ended up standing in my office asking me what should they do. So I finally learned my lesson and engaged my infection control team in a written plan. Not that we didn't have norovirus, but everyone followed the plan, did their particular tasks, and we got control within the week with only a few cases. So that was definitely a win. And norovirus, of course, is not a new problem, but there had been recent reports of a dramatic increase in the number of norovirus outbreaks. And the course of this illness, as you know, is seriously mild and it's of short duration. However, it can be severe and sometimes fatal to our most vulnerable patients, which is, of course, the elderly, the very young, and the immunocompromised. Norovirus does account, has accounted for 60% uh, of all gastroenteritis cases across the, uh, across the nation, and 50% of reported outbreaks in institutional settings. The CDC estimates that norovirus may be the cause of 23 million cases every single year, and up to 500,000 hospitalizations, mostly for dehydration, and as many as 300 deaths have also been reported, mostly along among um, elderly people in nursing homes. So according to the city CDC, outbreaks of gastroenteritis in Pennsylvania increased 443%, you can see it on the screen, from 2005 to 2006. So when you look at this table, all the other reporting states combined only experienced a 250% increase. It was 193% more of an increase in Pennsylvania. 
Thirty-two percent of these outbreaks across the state occurred in long-term care facilities. And norovirus was confirmed in 66 percent of the 2006 Pennsylvania outbreaks. As an example of how widespread norovirus outbreaks have been, this graph, uh, which was also in our advisory last December, um, shows our analysis of non-C. diff-associated gastroenteritis that you reported to PA PACERS. And it also shows the hospital reports of NHSN uh, during this time period, July of 2009 to June of 2010. The reports of cases in Pennsylvania long-term care facilities have started out um, on this graph uh, from 633 cases in the third quarter of 2009 uh, to 812 cases in the fourth quarter started to rise. But then during the first quarter of 2010, it surged to over 4,000 cases. And of course, the hospitals also reported an increase in the first quarter, which you can see in the, the uh, lighter blue uh, line. 63% of all the counties in Pennsylvania reported an increase um, in acute gastroenteritis during that time period. So our analysis uh, confirmed that Pennsylvania's marked increase in non-C. diff gastroenteritis was consistent with nationally reported outbreaks that occurred during the winter months. Some of our Pennsylvania facilities have had consistent success with norovirus control. So I'm going to share some of the tips that we learned from them and their collective wisdom a little bit later. The key to begin designing a robust prevention program is to have a credible source of evidence. The most reasonable place to start is the new CDC guideline that was published in March of this year. The CDC last published norovirus recommendations in 2001. So this new report uh, reviews substantial advances that have made in norovirus epidemiology, immunology, diagnostic methods, and infection control. It also includes specific recommendations based on the evidence, which we'll talk about throughout this presentation. The best way to fight this virus is to get to know your enemy. So for the next couple of slides, we'll take a look at the risk factors that increase the potential for a norovirus outbreak. It's estimated that exposure to as little as 10 viral particles contributes to the ease of sustained transmission of norovirus. And this leads, of course, to the increased potential for an outbreak in your facility. Uh, this characteristic of the virus leads to disease in 50% of every individual that gets inoculated with the virus. Norovirus causes intestinal and gastric damage, which results in malabsorption, diarrhea, decreased gastric motility, uh, decreased gastric emptying, and then vomiting. Viral particles are excreted in high numbers in feces and vomitus during the first 48 hours of illness. So people who are recovering from norovirus can continue to shed some viral particles for two or more weeks after symptoms subside. So those of us who think every, as soon as everybody stops throwing up and having diarrhea that we're good, uh, and you wonder why it still seems to be spreading, this can be the reason. There's no vaccine or medical treatment available for norovirus other than symptomatic treatment and replacement of those fluid electrolytes lost during vomiting and diarrhea. The incidence of norovirus outbreaks tends to peak in cold weather when people are more likely to congregate indoors. By the time we get to spring and the end of the virus season, the population immunity is at its highest, and then it drops again in, a couple of, in the winter months. So prior exposure to norovirus appears to provide only strain-specific immunity for just a couple of months, and this explains the high rate of repeat infections. And before your eyes roll back in your head, we only have one slide on norovirus genetics. Reinfection and outbreak recurrence may be caused by repeated introduction of any of these multiple different strains of norovirus. Norovirus can be divided into these five genome groups that you see here, and then inside of those, they are also classified then into 35 different genotypes. Those genome groups are uh, designated as G1 to G5, and the strains that affect humans you can see here are only in G1, G2, and G4. Since 2001, the majority of viral gastroenteritis outbreaks worldwide have been associated with the epidemic strains from the G2 type 4 virus. These strains evolved over time, and the virus was able to uh, escape the buildup of acquired immunity. There have been several studies published that demonstrate that antibody protection might last anywhere from just eight weeks to six months. Now, a norovirus outbreak, of course, can spread quickly in communal living settings, which we've experienced. Uh, shared toileting facilities are often used, such as hall bathrooms for group toileting, public bathrooms, and semi-private rooms. 
Group dining rooms can be, are often used for social dining um, and activities. And your residents who have incontinence hygiene issues significantly increase the burden of the viral load in the facility when they are vomiting and having diarrhea. Norovirus infection is characterized by the acute onset of nausea, vomiting, watery, non-bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramps, and typically a low-grade fever. Generally, symptoms begin within 12 to 48 hours, and this uh, self-limiting disease uh, resolves within a day or three. Now, prolonged duration and recovery from diarrhea and vomiting are associated with complications, especially in the elderly. And these can include chronic diarrhea, dehydration, and electrolyte disturbances. Uh, they can aspirate vomitus. You can also end up with a post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, uh, deaths have been reported from profound volume dilution, especially in the elderly. Norovirus transmission occurs by the fecal oral route from multiple sources of contamination. Food-related sources include uh, eating food prepared by the contaminated hands of food handlers who are sick with the virus. Norovirus illness has also been associated with eating shellfish or drinking water that's contaminated with raw sewage, um, contaminated well water, their septic tank leaks, or chlorination failures. Other sources involve oral contact after exposure to the contaminated body fluids and skin surfaces and environmental surfaces. Um, these surfaces that are contaminated with fecal material, this is often microscopic, so we really don't know. We saw like somebody would touch something that actually had feces on it, but the, the uh, smaller microscopic uh, viral particles are what gets us. Vomiting residents or staff members can disseminate the virus through airborne transmission, and, and here's the really disgusting part. Um, aerosolized vomitus results in droplets that can enter your oral mucosa and you can swallow them. Because norovirus remains stable on your hands for several hours, the majority of outbreaks primarily involve secondary person-to-person -person transmission. And we all teach our staff about the basics of direct and indirect transmission, which you see here on the slide. But we also need to know if they understand it well enough to affect how they clean our rooms, how they handle contaminated equipment, and, and how they give care. When I went out to my care areas, to observe these activities, I found that my staff had a very hard time visualizing this virus. They couldn't verbalize the rationale behind what they were doing, and they couldn't put the knowledge into action. So we brainstormed a little when we came up with jelly germs. And we used apple jelly and glitter to simulate direct and indirect contact with hands, gloves, linen, surfaces, and other residents. We made quite a mess, and it was a challenge to give care. And if you clean up, um, most of the little pieces of glitter each piece of glitter we said was a viral particle. And remember, even less than 10 can, can give you an infection. So it turned out to be an effective training tool and less expensive than some of the fluorescent training products, which, you know, are good to use, but uh, this was kind of fun and got the staff engaged. The third risk factor that increases the potential for norovirus outbreak is the environmental risk factors. Norovirus is easily transmitted, but it's difficult to remove from the environment. It's able to survive temperatures from 140 degrees to freezing. Norovirus is able to survive and continue to cause infection after long periods of time, not only on surfaces, but also in water. Surfaces that are soiled with microscopic aerosolized vomit, vomitous droplets um, or on contaminated hands can sustain an uncontrolled epidemic. And this is a really important point. Some outbreaks have been traced to contaminated computer keyboards which there are seeing more of, more of those in our facility. They've also been uh, traced to sinks in which food service workers first washed their hands, and then they went back to the same sink and rinsed off their fresh vegetables for the residents' meal. Norovirus is resistant to many disinfectants commonly used on environmental surfaces, and we're going to give you a list of the different disinfectants that work on norovirus. Uh, this virus is able to transiently colonize healthcare workers' hands, which can then transfer the pathogen. And there was actually a study done in the 2004 Journal of Hospital Infection, which found that contaminated fingers actually transfer norovirus up to seven consecutive clean surfaces. So the, they, the next seven things this person touched was contaminated with enough norovirus to make another person sick. From an administrative viewpoint, norovirus outbreaks in healthcare facilities often result in significant financial and operational burdens. 
healthcare facilities might not be prepared to manage large numbers of infected uh, residents. The outbreak can be prolonged, sometimes lasting months. Staff call-outs, sick leave, and overtime are also very costly. Additional healthcare supplies like linens and commodes will be needed, as well as additional cleaning expenses like bleach, sanitizers, mops, gloves, and gowns. Healthcare facilities may experience financial losses when you have to close units or even buildings um, until the virus can be um, contained or, or just runs its course. So the big question is, how do you help your multidisciplinary teams get off this annual treadmill and stop norovirus dead in its tracks? And how do you do that before it becomes an outbreak next season? Some guidelines answer that question. It suggested that the best method to reduce the risk or mitigate the impact of a norovirus outbreak is for healthcare facilities to develop a preseason action plan and to have a rapid response plan in place. Healthcare facilities and their staff are better equipped to respond to norovirus when you have protocols for preventive measures in place well before the norovirus season arrives. The effectiveness of your plan will be enhanced by developing processes based on a couple of key factors. Standardization, the first factor, is one method of ensuring that you have strong interventions in place that are structured to remove the potential for human error. Uh, you've, put, you've developed processes and you've, you've just looked, went out to the staff and you've uh, piloted them with the staff and no matter who does it, everybody ends up doing it the same. There's very little potential for human error. Outbreak control is greatly enhanced uh, by the rapid action of a multidisciplinary outbreak control team. This team advises and coordinates timely implementation of specific control measures, and they also assure that all levels of staff are clear on their task responsibilities. And of course, this team can be the same team you have put together for your infection control committee or your process committee if you have the appropriate people in place and just add this to your agenda. The awareness of best practices and their associated costs and work system and organizational factors are also likely to help you with implementation. Now we've come to the audience participation part. Um, at this point, we've opened up the polling questions you see on your screen. Uh, the first question is, does your facility have a preseason neurovirus preparedness program in place? And this would be a written plan that people actually know about and are educated to. Okay, we're going to look at our results here. And for the first question about whether or not your facility has a preseason preparedness plan in place, we have 25% yes and 75% no. So we're going to help you with that. Is your, the second question is, does your facility have a norovirus rep response program in place? And that would be responding to cases of norovirus or to an outbreak. Okay, it looks like we do have some results for this. Um, the rapid response program is uh, facilities that have a rapid response program are 34% of the attendees for this program. and uh, we have 65% of the attendees who do not have a norovirus rapid response program in place. So we're, we're going to talk through uh, both of those types of programs um, in the next couple of slides and, and help you put that program together in your facility. So on to our preseason plan. And this is the, our third objective that you saw in the beginning of the program. So let's talk about how you can incorporate incorporate each of these individual evidence-based interventions um, into your facility practices that are specific for norovirus prevention. So the first one is education, and, and these educational activities and best practices are a CDC 1B recommendation from the new guidelines. They're aimed at staff, residents, and visitors. Now, your staff may be have, having some difficulty adhering to best practices if they're not prepared. So educational activities should be in your plan and should include information on the viral host environmental factors, how to detect norovirus, how it's transmitted, the symptoms, and of course how to prevent it. Education should reinforce the correct and consistent implementation of control measures, for example, hand hygiene. You can do this by using uh, the, the types of educational materials we've all had experience with, the in-services, the handouts, the notices, and posters. Training is best accomplished as part of an annual staff training, which, of course, you'd want to do in the fall when it's close to a norovirus season. You'd also want to do that when cases are detected 
and throughout the duration of an outbreak. Additional uh, training activities include a periodic review and monitoring and reinforcement of adherence to facility protocols, which of course you want to base on current CDC, health department, and evidence-based guidelines. I think it's safe to say that those of us on the call today are very familiar with the various models of the chain of infection. I added this CDC uh, slide here uh, just to be useful to you to enhance your educational efforts and it's a nice change from the chain link style. It can be a challenge for staff educators to uh, come up with materials that will get the staff and the family's attention. And these new, brand new norovirus posters were designed by the authorities just in the last couple of months. Uh, one is for the clinicians and the other one, of course, is for the public. So the second preseason intervention is to develop and institute facility policies to enable rapid surveillance and clinical confirmation of potential cases. So your plan should include a clear case definition for active case finding. You want to work that out with your medical director. You also need some type of a line listing log, and that's to record daily symptoms and cases for the residents and for the staff. This process should define the unit-based systems to find, monitor, and record case information and also to determine the facility-specific baselines, both at the facility-wide level and also at the unit level. Because if you're looking at your systems uh, for how you're going to approach norovirus control on different units, you're going to have different processes on your gerocyte unit than you would use in your subacute unit. The CDC defines the case of norovirus as an acute onset of vomiting or diarrhea with three or more stools, loose stools, within any 24-hour period. An outbreak of norovirus is likely when you have at least three residents or staff members or a combination of those who are experiencing symptoms of the virus during a 48-hour period. And, and you want to get them to try and tell you about this as soon as it happens to get um, an early uh, jump on this. Continuous surveillance for symptoms of acute gift and aritis alerts you to respond to a surge or a cluster of cases above what's average for your facility, because of course you've done this baseline. Surveillance includes investigation for other causes of gift and aritis such as C. diff or bacterial infections such as salmonella or did everybody have carrot and raisin salad for dinner last night? While there's not the highest level of evidence supporting the resource intervention, your plan would be set up to fail without ensuring that you have a process for resource allocation. A resource plan is designed to address sufficient quantities of supplies, for example, for hand hygiene and enhanced environmental cleaning, a stock and supply of appropriate disinfectants, and a PPE for um, isolation rooms. Your pre-season readiness also addresses the availability, rental information, and location of single-use dedicated patient care equipment, such as commodes and rectal thermometers. Don't forget your emergency stock of toileting supplies as well as sufficient quantity of um, precaution signs and education materials that your multidisciplinary team and administrators have approved. We don't always think of communication as a mitigation strategy, but many a good plan has failed because everyone thinks someone else is taking care of communication. Now, the plan should include a process for rapid dissemination of information. So you want to ask your team, who needs to know the location and extent of the infection? How will control measure information get to those who need it in a timely fashion? What needs to be documented and where and when? Who's going to coordinate notification of ongoing cases? When you're developing your communication plan, you want to be sure to designate which individuals are responsible for managing communication to all of these different people. Just this one task, if the IPD tried to do it by herself and take it on alone, it's just too much. You want to make sure that each of your multidisciplinary team members understands their responsibility. And it's been suggested that perhaps a, designing a tear-off sheet with different tasks specific for each department or staff level might be helpful to your program. Next key component of a preseason plan is to develop specific staffing and employee health policies should an outbreak occur. The preseason preparation plan would address a process to exclude ill staff in certain positions, for example, your food, child care or patient care workers, you want to exclude them from work for a minimum of 48 hours after their symptoms are resolved. Exclusion of non-essential staff, students and volunteers should be done uh, in, in areas that are experiencing outbreaks of norovirus. 
we're going to establish protocols for staff cohorting. And this means um, a protocol in which the staff provides care for only one patient group on their ward. You, know, you have a nursing assistant who's, who's assigned to work in the outbreak ward every day, and they don't get moved around. Um, and if they move between patient cohorts, it just spreads the virus around. And patient cohorts include a group of patients who are symptomatic, a group of patients who've been exposed but they don't have any symptoms yet, and a group of patients that you're pretty sure haven't been exposed. And, and last but not least, and really important, is you want to consider adopting hu uh, human resource policies that do not punish, fire, write up your staff for not coming to work when they have a communicable illness. So now let's move on to assessment. I'll show you several tools that are customized for norovirus to help you de uh, develop your plan. And this sample checklist is designed to assist facilities with assessment of your facility-specific plan. It includes preparedness plan activities, basic precautions, enhanced precautions, and outcome and process measures. Um, it also itemizes multidisciplinary tasks so that you can implement an outbreak prevention program. It can also be used to develop enhancements if you have a plan in place or a checklist in place already. And all the practices listed on this form are supported by the current guidelines. Remember, this is a preparedness checklist, not something you pull out when you're having an outbreak. It's something you'll need to do now to prepare and check again if cases uh, do arise. A written infection control risk assessment and goals to prevent those risks provides you with a structured formal process that's intended to ensure that you're taking active steps to minimize the possibility of norovirus transmission. This format works you through an example of the potential for harm to the facility, the residents, the staff, the families, even the visitors. The important issues for a risk assessment are to know whether a potential risk is likely to occur, um, and we know norovirus does occur. Um, if harm will be significant should it occur, and you know we do have uh, residents and we talked about the risk, the potential impact of a norovirus on the facility, and how easy is it to detect? And of course, vomiting and diarrhea is very easy to detect. You want to also know whether the organization is prepared to handle it, and that question can be answered if you go back to your preparedness checklist. Once you've decided which evidence-based interventions you need in your plan it's a good idea to assess the strength of your interventions. Your plan might look really good on paper, but it's also important to identify your facility's barriers to norovirus prevention. You want to find out, for example, why it's difficult for staff to comply with some of your policies and best practices. Now, record review may give you some information about processes, but that's sometimes based on how good the documentation is. You know documentation guidelines aren't always followed. Another good way is to interview the staff and ask them about the process. Find out if they agree with the guidelines or the best practices. Ask them if there's problems on their unit they may hinder their compliance with best practices. Ask them if they have any suggestions for improvement. You can also walk through a simulated process. As infection preventionists wearing a lot of hats, we do not have the time to go out there and monitor all day long. So you, know, you want to set it up so that you can also find out what your staff knows and how they're going to practice. So you might know, get an empty room, get a bedside, you know, and, and practice a little bit. Have the staff try to comply with the guideline using this process. And you can also, of course, go out and actually observe them. It's best to go out and ask the people who do the job um, how the policies and procedures actually are working. Now, you don't need to be a process improvement expert to assess the effectiveness of your norovirus prevention program. We're going to work with your team to select an assessment tool format that gives you the best information with the least amount of work. This is an example of an infection control gap analysis that was completed during an actual observation of infection control practices. This observation identifies gaps in hand hygiene issues, ill staff, medication, equipment, group use, and PPE compliance. And when you're looking for the root cause of a potential process failure or an actual error for the process of a gap analysis, uh, one of the techniques you can use to find this root cause is to just ask why. Um, there's something actually called the five whys. Um, why, did hand, why was hand hygiene not done properly? Why does the housekeeper not know um, how to wash their hands or how long? 
Well, maybe they didn't get educated. Well, why didn't they get educated? And so on. But you sort of see the answer. It's, it's sort of like your five-year-old torturing you, but the five whys really do work. And it's a pretty simple method. Leaders of healthcare facilities play a, a, certainly a vital role in successful norovirus prevention. We can't do it without them. A 2005 survey of 516 healthcare facilities revealed several key behaviors that are exhibited by facility leaders who are successful in implementing infection prevention measures in their facilities. These practices included planning ahead to make sure that everybody understands their role and their tasks and they're clearly specified. And that's a lot of what we're talking about here today. Leaders inspire their staff at all levels to focus on a facility vision of clinical excellence and patient safety. But they, to do that, they have to actually talk to the staff. Um, we want to communicate and maintain high expectations. It's good for your leaders to have high expectations, but does the staff know what the leader's expectations are? And that's when we need to go out and talk to the staff. We want to focus on overcoming barriers and not just work smarter. We've all heard that. It's also important that leadership deals directly with resistant staff who just won't follow the program. Sometimes it's a good idea to listen to people who are the, the worst complainers because they may have some validity to their points. If this process just doesn't work, it, to, it, it, it can be broken in too many ways, and you know, they may be actually asking for leaders to go back and redesign the process so it works better. So it's good to listen to them. Now, the the uh, facility leaders can partner with frontline providers, meaning you know your DON and your um, Nursing home administrator can go out to the unit and actually talk to the people who are giving care or trying to follow these evidence-based practices. And some of the key components um, of, of doing that have been uh, published and used in the John Hopkins University uh, CUSP for CLABSI program. And those would be meeting on the unit, a regular day where you just go out every Thursday and, and talk to the staff, discussing safety issues, helping to remove barriers to implementation of outbreak improvement efforts. Direct communication with the staff leads to a more timely fix where you're not taking it to your boss and they're taking it to a committee and the committee doesn't meet for two months and then they talk about it and things, no wonder the staff sometimes feel that we don't fix things fast enough. It's important that your leaders, um, your NHA and your GON, your department heads, participate in your multidisciplinary plan and this helps them to know what resources are needed to support your plan. Failure to control norovirus is most often related to preparedness. When norovirus cases do pop up in your facility, the key to controlling transmission and reducing the magnitude of the outbreak is the rapid, simultaneous implementation of multiple control measures. These six interventions address risk factors based on evidence-based practices, and we're going to talk about each of those from the viewpoint of taking this practice from the guideline and operationalizing it for norovirus control. So, early detection of cases is a vital first step of outbreak control. Not all laboratories possess the ability to rapidly diagnose norovirus. So the CDC's 1A recommendation is to use this Kaplan's clinical and epidemiologic criteria that aids in the early detection of norovirus cases, and it has the four criteria listed here on the slide. And you, these are also listed in the new CDC guidelines. Now, the current standard for identification of norovirus and stool and vomit is, is a, um, a reverse uh, PCR uh, test, which is available from the State Department of Health Bureau of Laboratories. Stool specimens should be submitted as early as possible during suspected outbreak. Now, ideally, you want to obtain these from infected persons during the acute phase of the illness, and if it only lasts for one to three days, then you need to get it right away. For example, the Philadelphia Health Department requires liquid stool or vomit species, uh, vomitous specimens from at least five individuals uh, collected and put into a dry, sterile, leak-proof container and refrigerated until it can be transported to the state lab. Combined with the clinical uh, criteria, uh, that's, these are the ways that you identify an outbreak. Outbreaks of uh, uh, acute gastroenteritis should be reported to your state and local health department, to the CDC that, uh, via the National Outbreak Reporting System, which the health department will do. You also want to check with your local health department for their requirements. Surveillance activities for early detection include using line listings, such as the one uh, example that you see on this screen. The purpose of the tool is to initiate uh, investigations promptly, 
to collect clinical and epidemiological information, um, to document case information like you see here on the screen, description of the illness, the tests, and the outcome. Most of us have had some experience using this type of a surveillance tool, if not for norovirus, for other types of outbreaks. And one suggestion is to educate your floor staff to use the form and why you need this kind of information. This was one of the things that I did wrong because I ran around every day with my little paper asking people to fill it out. They couldn't remember what shift they started on or how many times they had diarrhea. So you want to teach your staff to, to use this because if it starts to melt tonight, you want them to document it right away. You can look at the information daily. You can use this form for conversations with the health department or with your um, supervisors. Now, health, some health departments do have a standard form that they want you to use, so you want to check with them. Now, we all think we know everything about contact precautions and standard precautions and isolation, and we want to know what's special about norovirus. Well, during an outbreak, it's best to place uh, residents in private rooms, which for most of us is impossible. Um, or we can separate them into separate cohorts. And a cohort is, is a group of, of residents who are symptomatic, a group who's exposed but asymptomatic, and then a group who's unexposed, which we talked about earlier. You want to provide separate toileting facilities or commodes for symptomatic residents, just hoping that the housekeeper, because it's your policy, is going to get in there right away and use bleach on the toilet in between people using it is really an unsafe way of, of trying to control norovirus. Residents and staff on effective wards should not be crossing over to on effective wards as much as is possible. You should continue precautions for a minimum of 48 hours after the resolution of symptoms. Now, there is some evidence that's showing that infants should be isolated for up to five days as they have the potential for asymptomatic viral shedding and environmental contamination. You want to ensure the availability and the use of personal protective equipment, including gloves and a gown. Healthcare workers and persons who clean areas heavily contaminated with feces or vomitus can be exposed to splashes to the face from residents who are vomiting. They can also swallow those viral particles from the air from aerosolized vomitus. Visitors having close contact with symptomatic patients or residents need to be instructed in how to use PPE and how to wash their hands. So what's an effective hand hygiene program for norovirus? Well, it's one that develops methods to promote and monitor frequent hand washing with soap and running water consistent with the 2002 hand hygiene guidelines. Now, the new CDC guidelines also recommend that 70% ethanol hand sanitizers can be used as an adjunct in between proper hand washings, which should never be considered a substitute for soap and water hand washing. The efficacy of, the, uh, of uh, alcohol is unresolved, but some testing has been done using 70 and 90% concentrations. They have a 30-second contact time against a norovirus surrogate called feline calcivirus that was used to experimentally uh, contaminate um, healthcare workers' fingertips. And they found that the most effective germicide was the 70% ethanol, but more studies are needed for that. So there also have been uh, recent studies with human norovirus that demonstrated that one full minute of hand washing with soap and water followed by rinsing for 20 seconds and drying with a towel, a disposable towel, completely removed norovirus uh, human norovirus from contaminated hands. So that's really important to know. A liquid soap and water rinse were both significantly more effective than the ethanol-based hand sanitizer. So we can see here that human norovirus is less susceptible to alcohol um, than, um, than the surrogate feline calcivirus. But one of the things I did in long-term care, of course, I thought was the right thing to do was to go out and buy a, you know, a case of hand sanitizer and give it out to everybody. But these new studies are showing that, you know, we really need soap and water still. Luckily, there's a sink in every resident room. Environmental reservoirs of pathogens during outbreaks are a contributing factor in ongoing transmission of outbreaks. And this is often related to a failure to follow recommended procedures for cleaning and disinfection. If we don't do this part, we might as well not do the rest of it. The plan should address your education, resources, implementation, and monitoring of environmental precautions. So resident care areas should be cleaned and disinfected at least twice a day. Highly touched surfaces or frequently touched surfaces should be cleaned and disinfected three times a day. Shared patient equipment, of course, should be cleaned between patient uses like it always is. You want to clean with an environmental protection agency registered product uh, that, that's able to be used in healthcare facilities. 
It's also important to follow your manufacturer's recommendations for the appropriate dilution of the disinfectant, the appropriate application, the appropriate surface contact time. If you don't follow all those things, uh, you know, you can always go back to bleach, but um, it, it can be really hard on some of your hard surfaces. You can use a chlorine-based uh, agent, uh, which is the bleach, like it's about a third a cup to a gallon of water is the 1 to 50 uh, concentration. We need to clean uh, surfaces and patient equipment before applying a disinfectant. And I'm just reminding everybody to remind their staff that presence of residual organic or protein loads on surfaces reduces the effectiveness of disinfectant. You just can't spray disinfectant on top of feces or blood or vomit or any of that. You want to clean and disinfect your surfaces starting from the areas with a lower likelihood of norovirus contamination. So they should start cleaning with the tray tables and the countertops, for example, and then progress to the areas with the highly contaminated surfaces, such as the toilets and the bathroom fixtures. You need to change the mop heads when these solutions are prepared or after cleaning large fields of emesis or fecal material. You want to make sure that you throw away disposable patient care items from isolation rooms upon discharge. And when it gets to community ice machines, you want to restrict them to staff who are actually wearing a clean pair of disposable gloves. You want them to clean and sanitize the ice scoops, the buckets, the pitchers, whatever you're using, at least once every 24 hours. Now, to get this done and monitored appropriately, the EVS checklist is helpful, and we will have one of those on our resources for you. And another way of getting your staff to understand the cleaning up of the viruses besides the glitter is feathers. And if you can get a bunch of feathers and dump them on the floor and say, okay, go clean this and don't, don't let them fly around, don't let them stick to you, don't let them get in your face, clean up all these feathers without making a mess. And, and, you know, your housekeepers can see what they have to do to get control of this type of aerosolized virus. Now, when we get to linen handling, um, certainly prompt, prompt, careful in the handling is a key factor. So your plan should include multidisciplinary methods to assure that your staff can follow these control strategies. And we're taught, for example, not to shake linens, and um, mostly it's because of dust, but in this case, you're going to aerosolize the uh, norovirus organisms that can be swallowed. You want to wear the appropriate personal protective equipment to minimize the likelihood that you get contaminated, your clothing or, you know, your face. Privacy curtains need to be changed when they're visibly soiled and when residents are discharged. Anything that's unused that sits in the patient room that didn't get used for that shift that day needs to get thrown away or put in the laundry. Um, you need to clean emesis or fecal material immediately, and especially from upholstered furniture. And you can use whatever manufacturer's approved agent works on the upholstered furniture. You know they like to bring their own chairs to the nursing home. Uh, those that they can be steam cleaned, and that will work also. But sometimes you just have to throw it out if you, if you it can't be cleaned. Now, some long-term care facilities still adhere to the old methods of keeping linen barrels in the room or using melt-away bags, but there aren't any recommendations uh, in the CDC guidelines for double bagging of linen, incineration, or modifications for laundering. So you really don't have to do that. And when it comes to enhanced precautions, if you have a widespread outbreak of neurovirus gastroenteritis, you didn't have a plan in place or it didn't work or didn't follow the protocols, but if you, if you still have some clinical areas that aren't affected, you've got five units and you've got norovirus in two of them, you may want to put just enhanced precautions into place. As mentioned earlier, just letting this virus run its course is uh, disruptive and very costly. Best to restrict symptomatic and recovering patients from leaving the patient care area other than for essential care or treatment. Um, suspending group activities such as dining and social events and group therapy. Wards can be closed to new admissions or transfers, and that may decrease the magnitude of your outbreak. Now, the threshold for ward closure or unit closure varies. That depends on your administration, individual state requirements. You can talk to your health department about that, and also your risk assessment. If you're going to permit visitors in the building, there should be a process for screening them for symptoms consistent with norovirus. And you should also be restricting them from affected areas during the outbreak. And some facilities who've had really bad norovirus outbreaks in the past may want to start here. As far as post-outbreak activities, uh, monitoring process and outcome compliance is fundamental to determine the effectiveness of your improvement strategies. It also will help you to find out if there are any barriers that exist uh, and the extent of those barriers. 
Reporting process and outcome measures to leadership, staff, and clinicians is really important so that you can talk about the barriers and also point your resources in a direction where you're having the most need. The norovirus outcome measures can be expressed as the rate of infection for a unit or facility. You want to divide the number of norovirus cases by the number of patient days uh, times 1,000. Norovirus uh, performance measures or process measures can also be assessed. You can do this through actual or simulated observation and interview, which we talked about. Now, an example of some performance measures include observation of compliance with hand hygiene, uh, observation of contact precautions, or environmental cleaning. To calculate these measures, you want to divide the number of observations that you do that they were done correctly uh, by the total number of, uh, um, of the observations that, that were uh, performed. And then time you have a new process, you want to go back and, and look and see if it works. Um, if, of course, you know, when I was in that great big 244-bed building, uh, I couldn't afford, I certainly didn't have time to go out and watch everybody wash their hands. Um, I did have a plan. Uh, part of my team helped me. And we did go out and spot check one unit every month for hand hygiene. We did that all year round because we didn't want to just start monitoring them at norovirus season. If you don't already have a process and outcome measure or process in place, uh, this slide shows an example of a tool of what that process might look like. The outcome measure areas look at norovirus defined uh, gastroenteritis as well as lab confirmed and clinical uh, Kaplan criteria confirmed um, gastroenteritis. There are two time periods which can be used to compare uh, units or year to year. And we selected process measures on this form that were consistent with the guidelines and you can customize it for your facility specific monitoring needs. And at the end of this talk, I'll provide you with access to the forms. And we wanted to know what some of the long-term care facilities who had no norovirus, who had low numbers, were, were doing to influence an effective and sustainable prevention program. So we interviewed representatives from five Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania nursing homes, not just Philadelphia, uh, over the telephone. And these facilities reported that the most effective practices that contributed to a rapid and successful resolution of their GI outbreak included praising staff, with a rapid, effective handling of outbreak activities and ill residents, an active president, presence of uh, nursing leadership, not just the DON, but maybe the nursing supervisor, uh, or an off shift. Um, then they would be doing things like supervising line listings, uh, making sure linen was being handled properly, environmental cleaning was getting done, and there were supplies available, as well as the other things that you see here on this slide. Other practices that were thought to be influential uh, in controlling norovirus outbreaks um, that we didn't, didn't make this top list were having a multidisciplinary team approach to tasks, the direct involvement of the medical director and the director of nursing, use of commodes for symptomatic residents, and closed group activities. And of course, these things uh, did come straight from the guidelines, and they found that they really worked. And these findings certainly uh, validate the necessity of having a structured norovirus control plan. So how do you translate evidence into practice? So, you know, a little phrase that gets thrown around a lot. There's a lot of information available out there, lots of literature about doing this. But there's still a lot to learn about how to put this concept into, um, into practice, uh, to operationalize it, so to speak. Now, there's a lot of facilities that claim to have adopted sound infection prevention practices for prevention of norovirus. You ask them those two questions. We ask, they say, yep, got everything in place. We're ready. But their recurrence infection rates remain a cause for concern. By simply creating and passively disseminating the information on how to practice evidence-based medicine doesn't often lead directly to implementation at the bedside. There may be substantial variability in the actual methods in which your staff perform infection prevention procedures. And a well-structured norovirus plan considers uh, certain key elements, which are also um, outlined in the um, John Hopkins cusp for CLABSI and CADI programs. Your staff's not going to read the guidelines. Um, didn't write it in our poll, but I wonder how many of you have actually read the guidelines. Page by page, you know, I sort of have to, um, and so should we. You want to identify the evidence-based interventions associated with improved outcomes, and, and we've done this throughout our talk, and we've shown you ways to get those elements out of the guidelines and into tools that you can use. You want to walk the process with your staff to help identify barriers. Get everybody who's involved in making sure that norovirus isn't spread around to share their concerns. Share the evidence. What was it in your facility? How many years have you had that? What made it better? What made it worse? Clinicians 
and your support personnel need to know why these protocols are important, and not just that they should do them. When to execute the interventions using a toolkit, that you have targeted the barriers um, and the standardization. And of course, regularly, uh, you need to measure performance, um, taking a look at the unintended consequences of some of the things that happen in your facility around norovirus, and talk to your staff to help everybody learn from the mistakes. So what are the key parameters for success? Now, listed here on this slide, I want to make sure that you, want, that you want to understand that when things go wrong, it might be your system that's cumbersome and just isn't working, it's not easy to follow, and not your people who are on purpose not trying to do it right. I think most healthcare workers want to do the right thing. They don't come to work saying, today I'm going to hurt my patients. You want to engage your frontline staff and your physicians. Don't forget the physicians. Help your, uh, your administrators and your executives understand how to partner with you on this process. This leads to leadership and culture change. Um, there is an HRQ, a culture safety survey, which you can access online. It's just for long-term care. <clears throat> that will cover more than norovirus. Education, of course, of your healthcare workers, while it's not the deal and end all of prevention, is an important element. And monitoring those systems and feedback. Here's some resources that we've, uh, we've talked about today. The uh, updated uh, CDC guideline um, is is on, you can access that online and on the CDC website. Um, the American Journal of Infection Control in 2010 June issue um, has an article about the role of surfaces in transmission of norovirus. The Environmental Protection Agency a list of registered products is available on their website. And um, the environmental cleaning checklist that I talked about, um, you can use the Association for Professionals of Infection Control C. diff elimination guide, the C. diff checklist um, for environmental cleaning can be used for norovirus as well. So what's in your toolkit? Well, at the authority, we designed a toolkit for you, which I'll show you in a minute, and also includes the documents from these slides. Uh, we have the assessment tool, which you saw in the line listing. We also have consumer tips, which you can give out. You can download for free and give out to your families and your residents and anybody else who comes through, your vendors. Um, we do have educational programs. We have an advisory article. And, of course, you've also seen the process and outcome measure tool. So these tools are all freely available for download on our website. You can see the URL at the top of the page. And just to summarize what we've talked about today, uh, the preseason development and implementation of a rapid response plan helps to reduce or mitigate the impact of a norovirus outbreak. The key components of a structured norovirus plan include ensuring basic outbreak control measures, using enhanced precautions, and conducting leadership activities. You want to translate evidence-based interventions from the guidelines into actionable facility practices that will modify those host, viral, and environmental risk factors for norovirus outbreaks. Host outbreak measurement of compliance with process measures is fundamental to determine the existence and extent of barriers and the effectiveness of your strategy. Now, for those of you who actually who implement this program in your facility in preparation for the 2011 norovirus season, we'd really appreciate it if you would contact the authority. You can do this through the help desk if you want uh, to let us know how it impacted your norovirus season in 2012, either uh, plus or minus. And we're hoping that we can start getting control of norovirus across the state by using this program. That covers our presentation topics for today, and now we'll have time to begin the question and answer session. We'll start with some questions that were, have already been sent to us earlier by people who are really, have been tortured by norovirus and have some burning questions. <clears throat> so um, one of the first questions that's, that has come up and has certainly plagued our help desk is how do we report norovirus to PACERS, especially if norovirus is not on the list of organisms? Well, uh, the bad news is, each norovirus case is one report. There is no group report for putting your 190 cases, and we're hopefully trying here to prevent you from having 190 cases, um, so you only have a couple to report. Um, we know that norovirus is not on the list of organisms. Um, if you uh, put that in the comment section of your report, we'll be able to track the actual norovirus that way. And of course, um, when you call your local health departments, we can also find out what's going on across the state with that. Otherwise, we're looking at 
non-C. diff acute gastroenteritis. And you know, the, the next question was that the state health lab only requires about five stool specimens, and is that enough to call it an outbreak of norovirus if I don't know for sure that it's norovirus? Well, it does, besides the fact that it takes a long time to get the results of these specimens from the state lab, remember we talked about earlier that the, you diagnose an outbreak, it's best to use the Kaplan criteria, that's the clinical criteria for early detection. And you can call it norovirus if it follows the Kaplan criteria. This will help you get an, a handle on prevention right away and also for conversation with your administrators because um, there's lots of other people who are, who are having symptoms and are having liquid stool whose stool is not going to be tested just because the, the state lab doesn't want everybody's. And if you waited for the weeks it takes them to get that back to you um, to call your outbreak, it would be all over your facility. And the last question is um, somebody asked who they should have in their multidisciplinary team. They were a little concerned if they thought they should have to develop a brand new team. We already have an infection control team and a PI team, and we meet for all these things. I can't go to any more meetings. And we don't really, you know, we're not, we don't make recommendations. But, um, you know, in my facility specifically, we didn't have a separate group. As I mentioned earlier, we took what we needed to do about norovirus and incorporated it into our infectious control process improvement meetings. If we were having an outbreak or having cases, we did get together and sit down and go over what needed to be done right then and there. We had a core group of people who were like our outbreak team that were going to, to sit and meet. And it might have not been everybody on the other team that we talked about, but it was a group of people who knew that, you know, we would meet in the fall just to talk about this. Okay. Well, um, I do want to thank everyone on the line for joining us. Uh, I hope this session gave you a good overview of the strategies uh, that are available to you to prevent norovirus this season um, and also to, uh, to get ready to reduce the, the, uh, the outbreak should you actually have one. We want to thank you again for joining us and taking the time to see our presentation today, and our program is now concluded.